What's going on in your neck of the woods? What is happening? Internet! I'm sure I made a bunch of people upset by yelling. That's okay. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're all doing alright. I hope everything's going great. It's the middle of the week. Cha-cha-cha-cha-cha. Yes. Middle of the week. Uh, middle of the week, and we've had a lot of good questions coming in on the Patreon page. If you haven't been over onto the Patreon page, we got a lot of good stuff popping up over there. And one of the things that has popped up is a little... Got to turn the lights down a little bit. One of the things that has uh, popped up is a bunch of questions about... And, uh, of course, now I, I moved the pop-up chat over there, and I lost my... There we go. Okay. So... <laughs> Um, a lot of good questions have been coming in about filtration of late, I think, uh, mainly sparked by Marcus H, who actually is new over there on the, uh, Patreon. So we've got a brand new person coming over to the Patreon and bringing the heat, bringing some questions about filtration. And, uh, we're going to talk a little bit at length about that today, cause that's the main topic today. Uh, so if anybody feels like they want to pop over there and check out what it is exactly I'm talking about, let me go over to scene seven. Ha <laughs> ha! I got it correct right out the gate. So we've got some pictures here, first of all, from uh, from Marcus, who posted them up onto the Patreon there. We've got some, uh, we've got some pictures, and then we got some exceedingly long explanations here so you guys can go over and check that out if you like um, at any point in time you, you could go over there I think this is who I'm not sure yes unlocked so you don't even need to be a patreon you can actually just go over to the page and actually read the uh, most of the community posts and stuff like that. We don't have we don't have much that's like locked out, but you can't post your own stuff unless you are a Patreon, and you can't really like comment on stuff if you're a Patreon. But you can go over there and check it out. Like we're not locking the door, you guys. You know, you can go over there, you can take a look at some of the stuff that's going on. Um, I believe you might end up with like a pop up or something like that. That's like, hey man. Maybe become... That's not inspired by me. I, that's not actively me telling you to do anything like that. But you can go over and check it out and see a lot of the posts from uh, our little community here. Uh, just on the basis that, like, hey, if it's something that you want to check out, you can go check it out. And then, uh, you know, if you do happen to want to become a Patreon or whatever, then you can. Uh, but otherwise, you can you can definitely go over there and at least reap the rewards of, you know, can read about some of the comments and stuff like that. Um, there's a big, long post here from... Uh, from Marcus in regards to anoxic filtration, which I think is something that is pretty, hmm. I think it's, it's not necessarily controversial. That's not really the word to put on it necessarily. Um, I think really what it boils down to is, um, I think 
that it sort of has gotten this this uh hmm what's the word i'm trying to put on it here uh, it's kind of gotten a little bit famous for the fact that it works right um and we're gonna go over a bunch of stuff today i have a bunch of stills and things uh i might say something wrong or whatnot feel free to, to pop into the chat and let me know if maybe i I say NO4 instead of NO3 or something like that. Just let me know, um, you know, because I don't really have like a ton of notes here. We're just going to talk about a lot of uh, filtration things and stuff that I've experienced over the years. And one of the things that I want people to know right out the gate here is that um, not all filtration systems are perfect. None of there is no real perfect one system. Most of the systems that I build um, is. Um, is, is geared towards having plants in them. So uh, that's something that I wanna remind people. I'll try to talk about some of the cichlid systems. I'll try to talk about some of the saltwater systems, but bear in mind, most of my systems rely on plants to do a lot. They do a lot uh, for us um, in our systems. That's the main thing that I focus on. And you know, one of the big reasons for that is I'm a huge plant guy I, and I do, one of my long-term goals is to help portray to a lot of people out there that, um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to become a farmer, but a little bit of agriculture in your life, I think is going to benefit pretty much everybody. And, um, as a matter of fact, I was talking to, um, Randy from the Aquarius podcast the other day. So shout out to the Aquarius podcast. If you guys haven't subscribed to that, you should find it and subscribe. Anyhow, um, we were actually talking about it and, you know, there are, there's many countries in the world. I think most people know that. Um, most of the advice that I have pertains to the United States because I'm American. I'm from America. I'm from the United States. That's where I'm from. So sometimes the, the biggest caveat that I typically run into is that somebody would be like, oh, I'm in Vietnam. This won't work in Vietnam. I got it. I got it 100%. So I would remind people to just take a, some of the things with a little grain of salt. It might be different in your part of the world. Um, you know, like maybe you're in Australia and you're like, dude, it's super hot here and I live in the desert and I don't know, man, I'm trying to work my system out and trying to do this. Yeah. So everybody, you know, remember we're all from, this is a world show, but I'm from the U S so I don't have the perfect advice for everything in every country out there because, you know, I don't, I'm not even familiar with a lot of the products in Australia, <laughs> you know, um, like I've gotten a lot of emails from people that are like, man, I'm in Australia. I can't get fluval lights because there's some kind of crazy tariff that makes them like four times the price or some, something nutty with that, you know, and I'm like, uh, I wish that wasn't the case. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you know, and I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. Right. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, you know, so I just, to, just to remind people, um, about that, that I don't necessarily have the answers for worldwide and all that kind of stuff, but a lot of the systems I'm building here is to try and make some changes, um, and hopefully, you know, kind of bridge the gap between the confusion of like, um, you know, maybe you are somebody that wants to grow some of your own food, which I think, especially in the United States is something that we all should be doing at least in a, in a, a small amount. You know what I mean? It's kind of crazy to think like, oh, I'm going to get a hundred percent of my food from outside. Um, you, you end up looking like a super skinny vegan from outer space. That's not necessarily the expectation that we all have for ourselves. You know, <laughs> I, I, there, I was literally, um, due to my interests, my autoplay on YouTube was actually playing a guy. Um, I was listening to a guy while I was working the other day, and uh, he's living off of whatever he could salvage, like from a from whatever he finds. So whatever he can get for free, and then whatever he could grow on. Um, I think it was like an eighth of an acre, and then he was fishing, and then he didn't have a car. He only rode his bicycle around. It's very interesting, but and not to talk ill of the guy. Like I, I appreciate what the guy is doing, but. There is kind of like, man, this is pushing it really far. Like, because obviously this guy's air quote lifestyle is his whole entire existence. Like that's all that he's doing all day long. So 
I feel like there's a balance between everybody's work life and, and home life and um, whether you're going to be – you grow some of your own food and run your own fish tanks and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's all that kind of stuff that you could – you know, that you could start to incorporate into your life. That's just these small percentages that could add up to make your life way better. You know, um, for instance, like Marcus's tank right here, you got to think in the depths of winter, it's January 12th. There's no holiday coming. Um, the new year's is sprung. It's 20 below outside and snowing. And you know what I mean? It's like, there's, there's no family coming over anytime soon. Cause they've already been over for all the, the new years and all that stuff. And, um, you, you know, just imagine that you could walk in and take a look at that tank and just sit next to it for a half an hour. You know, um, it really could, you know, it, it just brings that little bit of added goodness to your life right so i just think it's all these little incremental tiny things that people can do that start to add up like um you know maybe you live in an apartment in the city and you decide i'm gonna grow some cantaloupes on my porch you know because maybe you just have one of those little apartment balconies and you're like hmm i bet you i could get some pots out here i bet you i could use some of my fish tank water into those pots to water these things right um is, uh, you know, you really could, you know, do some of these things. And then this year you're like, oh, I'm eating my own cantaloupe, right? And then, you know, ne the year, the next year after that, maybe you got a slightly better apartment. You got a little more, got a little more area to work with. And then maybe you got two fish tanks now. So you got some little water change water from your fish tanks that you're like, hmm, I get getting some excess water here. Maybe I should put it to good use growing I don't know, star fruit. Whoa. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, and then just keep rocking and rolling. Like Karen Pepe says right there, I planted my raspberry plant. And I tell you, whew, raspberries are a hundred percent in my top 10 blueberries, raspberries. I wouldn't put strawberries up there. It seems for whatever reason, I think it's just a personal thing. Um, but if I could have raspberries and blueberries and avocado every day, I think I think that'd be a pretty decent, decent, decent life that just about anybody could live. You know, if you if you're eating avocados and blueberries and raspberries every day, I'm telling you, it could be could be a glorious life for everybody out there. Um, let me say hi to a couple of people in the chat and then we'll just jump into starting to talk about some filtration stuff because uh, the, the trickle effect is happening. We're starting to get enough people here uh, where we won't have to, uh, we'll, we'll try not to repeat ourselves over and over and over again, right? Oh, excuse me. I, <laughs> that was a weird burp that like, just came out of nowhere. Um, it's nature man is here. What's up my guy? Uh, finally made some extra money to buy a CO2 regulator, but the co-op doesn't carry the CO2 art ones anymore. Uh, I'm thinking about buying an Aquatech. Any thoughts? Um, I have an Aquatech, um, CO2 regulator, a dual stage regulator from them. I feel like the regulator is quite good. The solenoid is easy to replace if you need to and really not that expensive so if you got a dual stage regulator from them uh, with the solenoid it's quite good um, their six-way splitter is a disaster i don't recommend anybody even bother messing with that splitter so if you are going to split it try to look for a, a different manifold in order to do that with individual uh bubble counters in it like the co2 art um I know that uh, Aquarium Co-op isn't carrying the CO2 regulators and things anymore for an assorted, just a whole bunch of goofy reasons, whatever, not a big deal. They're just not carrying them anymore. Um, you know, it's just, uh, I happen to know the behind the scenes and it's like just a long list of whatever. Uh, I'm happy with my CO2 art, uh, dual stage and, and the, um, uh, the bubble counter and the splitting manifold, I really like that one, especially compared to the Aquatech. But the Aquatech dual stage regulator worked well for me, so maybe that'll work well for you. Uh, Kiwi Mamo is here letting us know, good morning, folks. <laughs> I wonder what time it is in New Zealand. So we got to go. It's uh, 
8 a.m.? Is it 8.17 there? I think it's like 8.17 tomorrow morning, I think. Could be 100% wrong. I bet you Gillett will let us know. Uh, but Gillett's here. He's from New Zealand also. So we got multiple people from New Zealand. And there's a perfect example right there that I was talking earlier. It's hard for me to give a, uh, advice to people in New Zealand, right? Because I'm like, I've, I've never been there. I'm not sure what's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know who's selling stuff there and who's not selling stuff there. So I try to, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier in the stream here, I, tr I try to keep it as uh, advice as wide, you know, so that the, the world will have an opportunity to try and implement things. Um, let's see. Let's scroll back up. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Marcus is the instigator of the filtration talk on the stream here uh, today and that's kind of what I got going on over there so you guys can look um, and by the way you guys can um, if I didn't if you weren't here earlier I mentioned that you guys can go over to patreon and look at the community page uh, as you can see right here the stuff is unlocked so I we, we try not to put things up that's patreon only uh, but I did just a shout out to the patronizers I did figure out how to do the Patreon only um, live stream earlier. <laughs> so I am sorting that out because um, I am going to start doing some some slight broadcasts onto, uh, onto Patreon. That'll just be Patreon only. Let's see. Tav Harag. Hareg, Harega says uh, it's 1 a.m. in Romania. Oh, it's 10.18 in New Zealand tomorrow. <laughs> so it's 10.18 a.m. in New Zealand Thursday. But it's not it's not Wednesday there. It's Thursday now. So uh, Sharpie's Modeling Aquatic. No, I don't eat fruit, but I love peppers. Don't ruin it for me. <laughs> um, I could see why somebody might not eat fruit but uh i dig the peppers too so we've done the peppers a few times here and mixed results that's for sure uh bentley pascal is here my only complaint with the aquatech is the needle valve is a little touchy compared to others yeah that was kind of one of the the big issues that i had um uh colin or uh sorry boston maine mike with a ten dollar super chat says uh colin uh, over at Thrive, Nicole, I don't even know how to say it. It's Colin G back, but the Colin part is backward. It's, the name of his company confuses the life out of me. I've mentioned it to him a few times, and it's not going to change. But um, if you look up Thrive, uh, if you look up Thrive Fertilizers, you'll find his website. Um, and he's saying he has some nice equipment over there, so that might be that might be a good guy. A good spot to check i'm not sure if he has co2 stuff for sale um i did message him a little while ago because i wanted to try out one of his reactors just against some of the reactors here um Corey at aquarium co-op uses his reactors and they work fine there i've messed with them there i wanted to um do a side by side in my fish room though so we're gonna see if uh if we ever get around to doing that which i'm sure we will it's just a matter of time uh but thanks for the support mike Appreciate it. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Well, I don't know. I could try to say hi to everybody, but hi, everybody. <laughs> There's so many people in the chat, and I struggle with saying people's names. So let's rock and roll onto fish filtration. So the first thing that we need to, to take into consideration uh, when we're talking about filtration for fish tanks, what is the main function that we're trying to do? And you know, realistically, the main function that we're trying to do is provide healthy water for the fish that are in there and maintain their life at the highest, highest level that we possibly can. Now, I've spoken about this at length times before. The basically the three chemicals that we're looking out for as far as what what's going on with our water col column that could be potentially dangerous for our fish would be uh, ammonia nitrite and nitrate and their their danger level is in that order ammonia is the most dangerous nitrite is the middle dangerous and nitrate is the least dangerous um 
you know, it takes quite a bit to poison your fish with nitrate. You know, you have to get real high for nitrate to really, really affect your fish. Um, whereas ammonia and nitrite, those are both pretty toxic and any kind of elevated level of ammonia at all. And you really got to start to figure out like what's going on with your filtration. Now, after that first part being said, like the main reason that we're filtering our water is to keep a healthy environment for our fish. And the easy way to keep track of that is through those three chemicals. How, what's the function that we're generally looking for and what's the function and how a filter actually works? It's drawing in water and it's passing it over some kind of surface. Now it could be running through a piece of foam. It could be running through, um, you know, a piece of uh, filter mat, something like that. That's all going to be categorized as mechanical. So we're basically going from, you know, chocolate milk water to how do we get to clean looking water. So it's nice and clear and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, once is going to be what's considered mechanical filtration. And then you have, you know, biological filtration. So mechanical filtration is going to be operating in conjunction with the biological filtration and the fact that we're going to be moving water somehow. Uh, if you go from a sponge filter, it is, you know, the air that is going down the tube is going to go and bubble up and come out another tube, which is going to draw water to go be pulled through that sponge. Now that sponge in a sponge filter is has the mechanic of drawing water through it. So do canister filters, so do sump filters, so do hang on back filters. They're all going to, you know, essentially each filter is just some kind of container or thing that is going to draw water through it. It's gonna draw water in, it's gonna pass water through it, out to the other side, okay? So when we take that into consideration, every filter is essentially taking water and putting water back in. It's just basically, you know, basically starting to create, you know, a circle, you know, where this water's getting drawn in and water's getting pushed back out. Now what's happening once that water enters that system? Now, the, as I mentioned, that first part is the mechanical part. It's going to grab any kind of particulates and stuff like that from the water. It's real easy to figure that out as a person, right? Is that um, if you think about it like this towel and I spill a bunch of coffee down here and I clean up the coffee, this thing's dirty and I got to go clean it, right? Now, if you happen to have a sponge, you can actually take the sponge out, clean the stuff out of it put it back in and typically reuse it for a certain amount of time until it starts to break down and then you're, you're going to have to replace it pads is sort of on the other end that you sort of just get them dirty you can spray them out if you like um and typically i don't go that route because they just don't they don't last as long but they are cheaper generally speaking um, so if you're just doing mechanical filtration one of the things that most people don't recognize is that just because that piece is mechanical filtration, they go, well, if I take it out and I throw it away, then it's not really gonna be that big of a deal. Although you are actually removing a bunch of bacteria. Now, if we start to talk about bacteria, there's basically, there's basically three types of bacteria that we could be trying to propagate. Why do we wanna propagate those that bacteria? Because that bacteria will take and eat Ammonia being the most dangerous, right? Convert it into nitrite, right? Then, then we'll convert it into nitrate, right? So we have uh, the three types is going to be aerobic, anoxic, and anaerobic. Um, and I wanted to pull up. I don't want to hold on. I want to accidentally get uh, your guys' comments on there, but I was going to pull up. I'm gonna make sure I get this right. Where did it go? No, that's not it. Where I had the article here so that you guys, oh, here we go. There it is. Nope, that's not gonna work. Let me see. Oh, it's gonna take just a second. The window has not landed on it. <laughs> Oh, 
man. Let's see. I wonder if I can do this. Oh, yeah. Here we go. This is one way to do it. This is not the smartest way to do your live stream. Oh, no. Let's make... Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. We got it back. So, aerobic, anaerobic, that's sort of the two ends of the spectrum as far as one is going to respirate with oxygen, one is going to uh, uh, respirate without oxygen. Anoxic doesn't even care if oxygen is around, okay? Uh, the anoxic is a description of the event without oxygen. So, anoxic filtration is essentially um, driving towards... Um, and I don't want to get this wrong. I want to double. Yeah, anaerobic and anoxic filtration basically go hand in hand, right? So anaerobic bacteria has developed in one of two stages, either low oxygen or no oxygen. Now, anoxic is normally what was referred to no oxygen, anaerobic um would typically in like fish culture and stuff like that mean the low oxygen developed is basically how it's going to be showing up if this is something that you guys are going to go look into um you know once you go like wait a minute let me go do some research and figure out exactly what this guy was talking about um but anoxic is a description of the environment without oxygen so you realistically need to get into a place that has weird pressure, um, no flow, no real contact or exchange with the, the regular air and stuff like that. So it really is something that is going to be, you know, as far as our environment is going to be developed within uh, a space that just kind of doesn't really have a whole lot of life going on. Uh, so that being said, does anoxic filtration or anaerobic versus aerobic filtration work? Yes, they both work. Uh, they both work quite well. Um, there's not really any... Um, let me get back to my page here. Oop. Are we on the right one? Yeah, there we go. Um, so i got to scroll back up. Ooh, ooh, ooh. There we go. Okay. Um, now, they both work, and they definitely both work within our... Uh, within our fish systems. Now, the problem is, I think a lot of people have heard me talk over the years and go like, what you want to propagate is aerobic bacteria, right? Now, the big, uh, the big issue with that is that we want to propagate a situation that is healthy for our fish while we have our fish. And I consistently tell people and my recommendation to people is to make sure that you have, um, is to make sure that you have, um, that you're propagating aerobic bacteria because it takes a really long time to get an anoxic filter, which is, you know, basically promoting anaerobic bacteria. It takes a really long time to get that going. Um, and it is really easy to mess it up. It's really easy to screw it up because it's something that basically needs no, um, and it needs no flow over an area that has a lot of biological material in it. And if you don't already have propagated a lot of aerobic bacteria, let's say you're counting on just this anaerobic bacteria to be existing and something, you know, let's say you have a pH change or maybe you have, you know, you do a water change and something kind of gets a little bit changed out of balance. You could have a real crash to your tank and end up, you know, killing a bunch of fish and stuff like that. They're not, and that's something that I would remind people that like, you're not going to get the fish back, you know, after they're dead. So the idea is try and maintain their health as best we can all of the time. And once we, you know, once we start to go down the path of setting something up that's going to take a really long time, we also have to remember to take into account how much people are going to change things over a short timeline. So aerobic bacteria, you can populate and get it to um, a healthy population, in my experience, with uh, essentially taking some uh, biomedia. Now, let me go change the scene here. Is it scene four? Yeah, there we go. All right, so we got out of this is 
out of the sump in my 240, right? Um, my 240, the sump in there is essentially a giant filter. That's like the whole reason for having the sump. Um, it, you know, not only is there aesthetic reasons, but the main reason is to have basically a giant filter. So this first chamber right here, and I actually put some new biomedia in there um, just the other day. So this actually is going to work quite well because we've got some old biomedia down here. You can see it's all brown. It's all nasty, um, which is fine. It's not a big deal. I mean, I might shake out the bag a little bit, but we've got the new biomedia. You can see how white it is and you know it's just brand new. So it's uh, looking super clean and doing all that stuff and just looking badass, right? This is just looking all dirty and nasty, but realistically you gotta you gotta flop your expectations here a little bit because the dirty one is the one that we want so if i was to take um uh, if i was to take the dirty looking biological media here that i know has good bacteria growing all over it take that and put it into a new tank and i'm trying to propagate aerobic bacteria because i can personally aerate the water a little bit right and once I aerate the water a little bit, I know that there is going to be respiration for the bacteria here to propagate, to break down ammonia, break down nitrite, turn it into nitrate. And at the very least, I can float some plants in the tank that are going to use up the nitrate really, uh, really quickly, right? And um, so once that, once I know that that's what's going on, I've, t I've tested this in the past that... Um, it really does only take a couple of days for it to for the bacteria to go from this biomedia, right? And just start to populate the new tank. As long as I'm oxygenating and I'm not at some kind of wacky temperature of like, you know, 45 degrees or um or 120 billion degrees, you know what I'm saying? Like as long as I'm just in my regular old tropical temperature and I'm aerating the water and moving the water around, I'm going to propagate that. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't do anoxic filtration at all because I do. Um, got to turn the arrow on. Got to turn this one off because in chamber two right here, you see this big tray down here? I do actually have a big tray of anoxic filtration. You know, that's what's happening in this tank in chamber two down here in the bottom. You can see I've also got big bags of biomedia up here where the water's moving around and there's even some biomedia that's just falling out all over the, the bottom down here. <laughs> you know, it's a sump. That's what the point It's supposed to be a little bit of a mess. If it was all polished and gnarly, you know, and fancy, I, I might not want to be taking care of the main display tank. Then the next thing you know, it's a whole disaster, right? <laughs> so I would recommend that if anybody wants to get into anoxic filtration, this is how you do it chamber one chamber two now chamber three doesn't really have anything in it that i'm showing you right now um because i don't want to spoil a bunch of stuff that i have coming up here in the short near future uh but you can see roots and all sorts of stuff growing here i do chamber three actually is just growing emergent plants so the emergent plants are up above the water uh, up above the water column. Uh, as you can see, it's very bright down here in my sump. It's it's lit up like a fish tank. Um, with the the old Fluval 2.0s that I have, that's where they, they live. They live down here in the sump, uh, the sumps now. And then I've got some spare ones that uh, I'm doing some greenhouse projects with once that gets going, whenever that gets going. Um, so if my recommendation is that if people want to get into... <clears throat> anaerobic bacteria which is the anoxic filtration i think that it's very beneficial if people have the patience and the space to really get it going but what i notice is is that most people if you were to start up a tank and then tell somebody okay now that you got it started you're gonna have to wait because typically it takes about four to six months for um, an anoxic filter to be working really, really well. Uh, for it to really kick in and be really populated and really get going, 
it takes a long period of time. And like I said, it's easy to mess it up because getting it agitated, getting it moving around um, allows opportunity for aerobic bacteria to occupy that space. The, the, the anaerobic bacteria just isn't that great at populating rapidly and doing stuff because, you know, it is involved, evolved to be in an area that just very much going on. Um, so, you know, you think if you have a field of rabbits and a field of elephants, right? Um, the, you know, how long is it going to take for the rabbits to take over this whole field on one side and the elephants to take over the whole field on the other side? Yes, the elephants do eat a lot more and they are moving around and, and uh, tearing up the terrain and stuff like that. Whereas the rabbits, you know, instead of there being 10 of them, now all of a sudden there's 100 of them, then the 100 of them start breeding and now there's 10,000 of them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the doubling factor is really kind of what we're going for as hobbyists because we don't want to end up down that road of going, well, I set up a tank and I'm going to get to put a fish in it six months from now. And then, uh, you know, you know, we'll, we'll add some fish in there and then hopefully we'll see what happens. Um, you know, and realistically, you know, if we talk about the anoxic filtration, it does work quite well. Uh, if you can really get it going, it does work quite well. The only, the big downside is, is that I think a lot of times there are people out there that are, you know, they take a system and then they try to evaluate it within a vacuum of its own space, right? Is that, um, you know, X amount of this will do X amount of that. And they never bring in the human element. Like the human element is really going to mess things up on a regular basis. Um, typically when you get to the point of, um, you know, people not necessarily having the patience to actually get and wait all of that time, they're probably going to make a change in between here and there. Um, so that's one of the big things that we need to take into account. Um, you know, we're moving the water. We do the mechanical filtration. For me, the mechanical filtration actually lands in uh, mostly in chamber two and chamber three. So instead of having it be completely in the front. Now, it's hard to see here. It's right over here. Mechanical filtration right there. And then chamber two. Whoops. <laughs> Grab the arrow. Oh, come on now there. Uh, and then in chamber two, you can see the metallic mat here. And then I use the polishing pad because um, I actually do my mechanical filtration behind the bacteria. So I actually do it after the bacteria. Um, and it does have a tendency for me personally with a sump to work out better. Um, I don't have to worry about the possibility of, you know, water splashing up and out of the sumps or anything like that, because um, my overflows are set that if the pads get completely clogged, the water will just keep going uh, and go past the pads. Whereas if I were to put the pads and mechanical filtration in the first chamber, there's a, ch there's a chance that they get completely clogged up and then water starts splashing out and all that kind of craziness. So, uh, and I have found that the bacterial population is not really affected by um, the mechanical being in front or behind or anything like that. Uh, but in chamber number one, uh, it's really hard to tell from this picture, but I probably should have taken a wider shot picture, but in chamber one, I am adding a ton of oxygen right here. So I'm actually, uh, so what I'm actually doing is I'm actually running a ton of air into chamber one so that I can propagate the aerobic bacteria, which is the oxygen consuming bacteria that is going to rapidly, um, you know, it's going to, it is essentially going to rapidly reproduce and consume via, via numbers. You know, you know what I'm saying? They're going to be, they're going to be the rabbits. They're not necessarily going to be the elephants. Right. Um, and, uh, Brenda, Brenda is wondering, or elephant sized rabbits. Um, Elephant sized rabbits. What was that movie called? I got to figure out what movie that is. Um, this one right here. Let's go. I think it was night of the rabbit. I think, I think it was night of the rabbit. I want to double check. 
No, that's not it. Uh, what was it? Killer Rabbit movie. Killer Rabbit horror movie. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I think it's Night of the Lepus. I think that's what it is. The Killer Rabbit. No, that's not right. Night of the Lepus. I think that's it. Let me see. Night of the Lepus. Yep. Yep, that is it. Night of the Lepus. This movie used to come on in the middle of the night. I think this is the right one. Gosh, maybe that's not it. I think that's it. Yeah, that's got to be it. Yeah, Night of the Lepus was supposedly giant rabbits. And yeah, that totally is it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. This movie used to come on in the middle of the night all of the time when I was a kid. So when I was a kid, the Night of the Lepus, let me see. And I'm going to tell you, let me copy this so that I can uh, actually post the correct thing here. Um, there we go. Paste. Yeah. So it, um, it is probably one of the cheesiest, worst movies you've ever seen, but it does have giant rabbits that eat a bunch of people. And it, it doesn't even seem like they're eating a bunch of people. I think it's really hard to even say that it was like <laughs> scary, but it's a air quote horror movie <laughs> about giant rabbits getting people. Um, <laughs> Sharpies models and aquatics is dang. I thought I knew horror movies. <laughs> it is a, uh, it's a next level awful movie. It's, it's not, I mean, it's funny. I mean, maybe if you watched it in 1972, you might've been freaked out, but I'm guessing that that would probably have a lot to do with maybe people in 1972 were like on a lot of drugs or something. And they just thought that was scary. I don't know. It's not that scary though. I've seen movies from 1972 that are legitimately scary today. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe they were just making it as a joke and people thought it was scary or something. Whew. Ooh, Killer Bunny. Um, that was the Killer Bunny of Antioch. I don't know if I've seen that one. Let me copy this. Killer Bunny of Antioch. Oh. <laughs> of course I've seen the Holy... Of course, I've seen Monty Python's Holy Grail. I used to watch um, the Holy Grail all the time. But yes, the uh, the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch um, is a visual satire of the killer rabbit is defeated by the Holy Hand Grenade. That's a good point. Those killer rabbits, they were trying to get you. They were trying to get them. Uh, anyhow, so let's get back to our little filtration talk here. And I think the funny thing is, is that most people... Um, in the hobby here are pretty are, are pretty knowledgeable about most of the things that are going on now as i mentioned before i do think that the anoxic style of filter is quite usable because i actually do use it in my aquariums but i have as a as a reminder i will always remind people that it is not the main filtration that i have going on the main filtration that i have going on is with aerobic bacteria because I know that I can propagate and quickly, you know, quickly get it to um, reproduce. I don't know if reproduce is the right word. What am I talking about? Yeah, basically, it's going to replicate itself and all that. Um, I know that it's going to reproduce. It's going to keep doubling in its population pretty rapidly as long as I'm providing some food, which would be in in bacteria's case ammonia 
or nitrite, like if I'm providing any of that stuff, it can it can start to consume that and break it down through the nitrogen cycle, which does get kind of confusing at times, but to over oversimplify it, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the bacteria is going to consume uh, and, you know, the aerobic bacteria actually is going to utilize the com the combining oxygen to uh, the ammonia and nitrite in order to turn it into um, nitrate, right? Because it's going to combine some of that oxygen with it, with the ammonia, remove the hydrogen, hydrogen gas gets released, hydrogen gas just goes up and out, and, um, you know, then you end up with NO4 or NO3, right? So, you know, uh, I, I think that it's uh, a, a great addition that you could add if you have the space for it, like I do. Um, it's one of the reasons that I built big sumps, added big sumps, and I've definitely added it in um, to my systems. And I think it's something that is valuable to be able to add if you can, uh, but you don't need to get super crazy with your filtration like I do. Um, you know, if you are somebody who just has an aquarium with a hang on back filter, um, not a bad deal. You can definitely run a lot of tanks and stuff like that. Um, one thing I would remind people that I think doesn't get mentioned very often is to remember to not overstock. If you have too much of a population of fish and stuff like that in your aquarium, um, you really do start to limit the ability of your filtration, which is something that you could do with anoxic filtration with a smaller volume if, um, if, 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 if you can take the time to set up uh, a straight up anoxic filter before you add all those fish in. So let's say you have a healthy, um, uh, you know, a healthy amount of bacteria that's actually breaking down ammonia and things, and uh, you're able to go from there because. Uh, but you're going to have to set that up way ahead of time and constantly be feeding the thing. So you're going to have to be feeding it ammonia for it to, in order to operate. And the best situation that I can relate to most people out there is th this is similar setup to, um, hold on. I got, I got a weird nose whistle thing going on. I don't know what I got a weird whistle nose whistle thing going on. Sorry about that guys. Um, but what was I talking about? Oh, so the systems that we're used to dealing with as humans, uh, the one thing that I can relate that is similar to an anoxic filter, um, is a septic system at your house because it is constantly being fed waste, right? Without, um, really being a detriment to anybody around because, you know, you have it buried in the ground. Uh, it's going to be collecting all that waste. It's going to be full of bacteria down there. You're always replenishing with more bacteria, more waste, stuff like that. You know, when people go to the bathroom, it goes down. Um, you know, one of the, honestly, one of the worst things that can really happen to a septic system is it just sitting there vacant for, uh, years, you know? So, um, you know, it's because you're not having the, the added water going in. You're not having the added, the bacterial cycles not going. So if you have a septic system that's been sitting for a long time, you normally have to, <laughs> you know, you normally have to send a bunch of water down there, uh, in order to make sure that the tank is still holding and it's not all going to leak into the ground. But, um, and then you have to send down a bunch of, uh, bacteria down in there to kind of jump the jump start the thing, but I would never recommend adding anything like that to your aquarium to hopefully jump jump start the the bacteria in it. Um, it would probably that back that packet that you add is, would probably just kill everything in the tank. So um, you know when I do talk about like what kind of filtration people are running, like what they could change, what they could do, I always try to take into account that the human is involved as part of the filtration system. You know, how often are you doing water changes? What kind of temperature do you have going on in your water? Because as temperature elevates, you know, you can't hold as much oxygen in the water. You can't hold as much CO2 in the water. So if you had water that was actually sitting there at like 130 degrees, yeah, if you had some water that was sitting there at about 130 degrees, like barring the evaporation, um, you'd have... A, the doubling of anoxic, 
you know, of uh, 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 anaerobic bacteria would r- literally be doubling and until it ran itself out because um, you'd have a lot less oxygen in the water, a lot more opportunity for that um, bacteria to continue to go and, and double and double and double and continue to consume. And then there's really like the, the downfall is, is that it would, it'll generally just eat itself um you know, it'll basically just eat up on the whole environment unless you continue to add to it. But we don't really have anything that can live at like 130 degrees, you know. So if you have a tank like, um, you know, a discus tank is a perfect example. You know, you have that thing sitting there at like 98 degrees just kind of jamming away, right? Um, you know, you got that water super hot for the for the discus, discus to keep them healthy and stuff. And then you got to keep dumping and doing water changes because, um it's really difficult to, to continue having the, an anoxic filter work and have no water passing through it. Like that's the big downside to an anoxic filter. You basically want it to be underwater, but nothing being forced through it. And, you know, water being forced through it, as we've talked about earlier, is generally what all of our filters do. Um, and so that's really kind of the barrier. And as you can see here on my sump, like, so this is my filtration box that's right here. Water comes from this chamber, goes down, then passes to go up and out through the top. Like this uh, baffle right here, the water goes up to the top. So it literally comes in down here and then goes back up that way but it's passing through here with not a lot of speed because as you can see down here, there's this opening. It's not that big. It's, um, you know, this is a large area for the amount of water that's passing through it. Like, you know, we have a pipe that's coming down into the tank. That's a, I think it's a one and a half inch and it's not even, you know, it's not even fully loaded with water. Um, it's maybe half full or a quarter full or something like that. Um, and, uh, so it's doing that, but there's just not that much water to actually be flowing through there. So it's not moving through quickly. It's actually just kind of, you know, going nice and slow and passing through there and actually kind of just going around that, um, little bin that I have there. But you know, what most of our filters do is push, push water through it. And that's generally not that good for, uh, anaerobic bacteria. It just doesn't want really anything hitting it. <laughs> it just wants to be wet. Uh, Dovi Dosset says, but we do the same thing. Don't we, when we add old filters or old media to a new tank, isn't that what it is? Reseeding the bacteria. Um, Oh, in relation to, we used to flush this bacteria into our septic system at the cabin each summer. And as we left each fall, yeah, that's pretty much um, what you're doing is trying to seed the bacteria that um, to get everything growing back into that septic system. Like um, it's bad enough that like if you have a summer cabin with a septic, you know, a lot of times there isn't much that you can do because you're just gone. Um, But if you come back every year, it's not optimal for a septic system, but it definitely is better than even just being gone for two years from a property like it just... It's really not good for a septic system for just to have nothing going into it. Um, UG Aquatic says you don't have to drill a tank to use a sump. You just need a return pump matching siphon. Um, I, I mean, it's not required to drill the tank to run a sump, but um, I certainly recommend people to do that. And one of the big reasons is uh, a siphon is the main source of any kind of flood. And uh, the the question I get constantly about my sumps and stuff is like, oh, if the power goes off, the sump's going to flood. And I'll tell you this much. Do you think that that would be something that I would put up with (laughs) if the power or if it just got unplugged or anything like that? Oh, now it's just going to flood the whole entire tank all over the place. No, that is not the case. It doesn't flood. It doesn't do anything like that. Just turns off maybe a couple of gallons, you know, maybe eight extra gallons or 10 extra gallons or something like that, uh, go down into the sump and then it just sits there and waits to be turned back on. So, um, to all those people out there that, that think my tanks flood every time that the water turns off, um, that's weird. It's a weird thought. 
It's a weird thought that you would vocalize into text. <laughs> but uh, you don't have to drill a tank, but I just highly, highly recommend it. Um, siphons are really the opportunity for um, a failure to end up with a flood. And uh, one of the biggest things in plumbing is um, you always want to use gravity to your advantage when uh, when plumbing something. You know, you want to have the least amount of uh, mechanical things in the way or required in order for the plumbing to work sufficiently. So the same thing. Uh, so I, I go that same route with my aquariums that I would with like somebody's house that we want to make sure that everything works. All right. I'm going to start answering some questions here because I feel like I just talked about uh, filtration for like 45 minutes or something like that. And I'm not sure if I'm even answering anybody's questions. So let's, let's answer some questions out of the chat and see what's going on. Uh, Alyssa says, I suppose I only get jealous of the sumps because of how much water volume you can get and ease of use. I just hate drilling tanks. Oh, that's what, <laughs> that's what UG must've been talking about. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the big reason that I got super jealous and for the modifications and for the ability to do experiments and the extra space for extra plants and all that kind of stuff. Like I, for me personally, I just have so many, so many benefits that I just keep rocking with it. Johnny Zelaya went to Florida on vacation, sniffed out the local fish store and ended up coming back. With a rimless Mr. Aqua 22 gallon tank, some rasboras, and a half beak. <laughs> I do like those Mr. Aqua 22 gallons. They're pretty dope. Um, Cheshire Cat says, My beta tank is at 82, according to one thermometer, 78 to another, and the heater is set to 79. I don't know what to believe. The water's pretty warm, though. Um, get, a, uh, get a laser thermometer. It's the one that. Um, let me see if I can find the one that I use real quick. Uh, let me see. Laser. 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 Thir. Yeah. Where's the one that I use? Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Mm. Do, do, do. Doodly loot. Wow, this is weird. This is the first time I've ever seen this. Um, but uh, let's see. I purchased this item in 2015. Right there. Copy. Let's go to the chat. Bazawi. We'll throw a little bit of paste on there. There you go. That's the thermometer that you need. The laser grip. 1080. <laughs> oh man, there's a laser grip 1022. Is that one better? Seems like it's less numbers, right? Is it better? I don't know. Oh, for a dollar more, you could get the 1022. I don't know. Is the 1022 better? I don't know. I bought the other one uh, in 2015 and it still works great. I used it the other day. Uh, Mark Vickery says, I probably won't ever get a big enough tank to put a sump on. Um, I put sumps on 7.9 gallon tanks before. And I put a sump on, I think it was a 4.2 gallon. But I feel like I should get an even smaller aquarium and put a sump on it, I think. Uh, Alana Suki says, do you point the laser at the glass or open the lid and shoot hundred percent open the lid and, uh, get the temperature from the water that way. Um, you'll find a slight like three to four degree variance, maybe less than that, maybe more, but, uh, there is a variance if you are firing it through the acrylic or glass or any of that kind of stuff, it does distort the, uh, the temperature reading. So definitely shoot it straight at the water, uh, like open up the top and shoot it straight down into the tank. It'll give you a good idea of what the, uh, give you a real close idea of what the temperature is. Uh, there seems to be some more expensive infrared thermometer guns on here, but you don't need those. You don't need those bells and whistles. You guys, none of those are even useful. Look at this one. Uh, infrared thermometer, non-contact digital laser, infrared thermometer gun for kitchen meat food 
cooking barbecue automotive industrial thermostat with flashlight HD backlight LCD display. <laughs> <laughs> The name of that item hurts my brain. Hurts my brain that somebody would have put that in there and looked at it and been like, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to title this product. Totally makes sense, you guys. (laughs) All right. What do we got going on in the chat here? Uh, TK Sprayer says, my tank is foggy and there's no fish in it. Why is it foggy? Um, chances are you've either got a bacterial bloom or a algae bloom. One of those two are happening. Um, would be my guess. It's not a whole lot of information for me to go off of, but if I was to go off that question, that would be my guess. Uh, Wayne Petrio says, can artificial plants cause brown algae in aquarium, even though nitrates, uh, are at zero parts per million and carob sea naturals sand substrate. Um, well, generally, brown algae is a diatom, or you're just getting brown algae long after it's cycled. Uh, diatom is generally part of a cycle or a new tank setup. And um, so if you get that diatoms going, they're chewing up all the silicates that could be left. So uh, depending on the plants, I guess you could have accidentally added silicates to the water, right? You know, I, so you, uh, but if you see that diatom, that brown algae, it generally is just chewing up um, the silicates and stuff, and you should be good to go. Daryl S just showed up, and he's got the member arrow. Thank you very much, Daryl. We actually got some, uh, we actually got our memberships went up and our memberships went down. So we're still, we're still short of the triple digits on the old members, guys, but. Still, mad props to all the members and the Patreons and stuff. That's for sure. That goes out. A shout out. Um, Let me see. Let's go back to scene. Whoops. We've got full screen chat. That's too much. I can't give you guys the whole screen. It's just, come on, dude. What are you doing? Stop doing that. Keep sending it to full screen. All right. Um... Oh, yeah, let's change the scene back to, oh, I have to do this over here first. Okay, so let me go back to scene, nope, that's the wrong one. There it is. Okay, so now we're back over here, and let's talk a little bit about Mark's post. Uh, and there we go, we got the chat back, except it's cutting in. We have to move it like Uh, I have to make it smaller. Okay, there we go. Uh, But yeah, so to answer your question, Wayne, yes. Depends on uh, where you're getting those silicates from. Uh, But nitrates at zero parts per million, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a a whole lot. It's just a part of the picture. So I definitely recommend people to go out there and start um, testing their water a lot to really start to find out what, what, what is going on, um, and what's happening. I guess I have to move the chat over here. It's having problems like displaying. It's posting a bunch of weird letters in it and it's impossible to read. So I'll move it over here. See if I can't read it better from here. Uh, TK sprayer is saying, do you need an air pump in an aquarium? In my opinion, no, um, you don't need one. It is, uh, it's a beneficial addition depending on um, what your flow is like and, um, you know, because if you're getting a lot of, like, flow and surface agitation and that kind of stuff, you're not really going to need an air pump in the aquarium. Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be detrimental if you had it, but it's really detrimental to the aesthetic as far as I'm concerned. So that means the look, the overall appeal of it, if you have a giant... Uh, bubble wand like floating around in the back just all these bubbles going up Uh, I don't like that I really don't like the look of that so I definitely recommend people to add it to the sump if that's a possibility add it Uh, I mean can't put it in a canister filter a hang on back filter does a lot of aeration I think people don't necessarily realize that it's pulling a lot of water not very far from the surface and it's generally putting uh, a lot of water back 
onto the surface, which is going to agitate uh, with the air column above. So you're going to end up with um, some aeration happening there. Jason R. says, in some videos of warehouses, i.e. Glazer in Germany, they have a tank with a steel supports, four plus inches from the corners. Curious about the max overhang. Thoughts? Um, they have the tank with steel supports, four plus inches in from the corners. Um, I am unsure. Oh, do you mean like the wall supports for the tanks, like to hold all the tanks in place? Um, yeah, there are a lot of people out there that actually just use that angle iron and then just stick one, you know, they're like weld one side. So it just makes a lip. Uh, you can do that with glass tanks, but you can't do that with acrylic tanks. So <clears throat> basically, as long as you're supporting, I mean, you could probably get away with just the two sides of a glass tank, but it's probably not recommended. But I, as far as I know, you can get away with just supporting three sides of a glass tank for a really, really long time, and it'll hold up uh, probably just as well as it like sitting there flat. Uh, Marcus H. Said, Hi, Joel. It seems that there is a lot of contradictory info about anoxic and anaerobic on the internet, but I found this. Anaerobic equals total absence of free oxygen, O2, or bound oxygen, NO2, NO3. Anoxic, absence of free oxygen, but the presence of bound oxygen. Yeah, that's, that's probably accurate. I might have been a little bit off on exactly my description. I think if this was something I was doing a presentation on, I probably would have been reading from note cards. But um, as far as I know, off the top of my head, the anoxic is the development of something with no oxygen around. Um, anaerobic is the development with bound oxygen. But that might I might have gotten that backwards, but that's as far as I know. So um, it definitely could have been back, back you know, I could, I could have that flipped around. But... Both of those bacteria essentially are super difficult for humans to be, um, you know, capitalizing on. If you if you're really trying to capitalize on bacteria, um, that's why you'll see like, you know, like Seachem Matrix is a perfect example where you have um, that, you know, the the matrix is their biological filtration, but it's pumice. You know what I mean? So I mean, yes, it's really nice pumice. I'm not trying to start arguments with Seachem about it. It's really nice pumice. It's clean. I just thought it was super expensive when I bought it like seven years ago and people still tripping over that video. I even got a bunch of comments about it this morning, which I'm like, all right. Um, but even with just that bacteria, uh, the bio rings that I use, the ceramic bio rings are going to do the same thing. Uh, anything with a lot of surface area is essentially going to do that. And as humans, this is the caveat I'm saying here that as humans, it's easy for us to oxygenate the water and, you know, um, propagate a situation where aerobic bacteria is going to find it easy to replicate and do its job. Um, and it doesn't take that long for it to um, replicate, double its population, double its population from there. And then the next thing you know, it's actually a cycled aquarium. That's why... Um, even where, you know, with aerobic bacteria, it takes about 50 days um, in a kind of a healthy situation for it to fully cycle a tank from scratch with no seeding of the bacteria or anything like that. It takes about 50 days. Um, most people will say 60 days just to be like, it's two months, right? Uh, but it is about 50 days uh, before a tank will fully cycle without anything other than like ammonia being added to uh, allow it to replicate, you know, have a food source. Um, Ian Anderson says, are fish less likely to breed or fish less likely to breed in an aquascape setup as opposed to something that's made more speci species specific? Um, now that's a really kind of like dependent question because if i had an aquascape setup that was set up to the parameters of a specific fish where they bred in i think them breeding is going to be a lot higher than in a breeding setup now most of the breeding setups that you guys see out there on especially youtube and stuff like that are breeding setups that are mainly cultivated for 
profit, right? So let's say, let's compare and contrast a little bit here. Um, most of the people that are breeding rainbow fish, right? That's because you have to collect their eggs. You have to make sure that they don't fungus. They don't do this. They don't do that. So like Gary Lang would be a good example. I've uh, talked to him quite a few times. And, you know, one of the reasons that he's doing that system is because it's difficult to actually like hatch and raise and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he wants to make sure that he's turning around a certain amount of eggs and all that kind of stuff. But let's say you had a rainbow fish tank where they were just in there. They were dropping eggs. They were uh, being fertilized, all that kind of stuff. Like you would eventually get more and more rainbow fish. Um, but if, if you're somebody that's in a spot where you're like, look, I need to have a hundred rainbow fish by the end of the month. You can't just let them do whatever the heck they're going to do over there. Right. And just hope it's going to be the best. But uh, you really need to stay on top of it, hatch their eggs for them. Um, I know that a lot of the big time breeders out there will remind people that, you know, fish aren't very good at being parents. They just aren't, you know, that's, that's why you'll have a fish that has, that drops 200 eggs a day or 50 eggs every two days or something like that. Like they're prolifically breeding because they aren't very good at, you know, raising a couple of, um, you know, raising a couple of, a uh, couple of fawns, for instance, like a deer only has like two babies and they're not even that great at it either. But, um, you know, because they're trying to propagate and not be very good parents, you know, they, they drop a lot of stuff. Dr. Wigglespank says, once your tank is cycled, how often should you dose ammonia? If you don't plan on adding fish right away, uh, you're going to have to test for that. Um, because generally speaking, once the tank is cycled, I'll normally do something like add a couple of algae wafers or like uh, a type of food like ONIP tab, right? Like I could just drop one in there and not worry about it for like a week because that's kind of as that breaks down, it's going to add stuff in there that I'm looking for. And it will also kind of propagate the microfauna that we definitely want to have happening, which I'll do a video on microfauna later, but it seems like almost almost everybody around here has a pretty good idea of stuff, but I wouldn't add ammonia after it was cycled. I personally um, just add a little bit of flake food or something like that that um, will break down and release some of that stuff and sort of it'll sort of act more like what it would be like to have fish in there, you know, once I'm getting there ready uh, to add fish. Famous Jones is here. What's up? Uh, Jason R says word count limit. Uh, it just looks like the four corners are not supported. I uh, wonder if there was a range of distances from the corners where the tank could overhang the support. That I don't know. That I don't know. I would have to... Jason, send me like a picture or something because I'm, I'm kind of confused with what you're talking about. Maybe post it up on Patreon and we can talk about it on the next show. Uh-uh-uh. Meow, 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 meow. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Sharpie's models and aquatics says deer don't tend to run around and eat their own young straight away either. It's a good point. All right. Well, I, as I mentioned, I, it sounds to me like everybody's got a really good grasp on, on what it is that they're trying to do. And, you know, I'm appreciative of Marcus sending this in. I would highly recommend anybody go, uh, over to the Patreon, uh, read his little read his write up here it's a little bit it's not long it just takes a second to read it would just take me a while to read it out loud um check some of the video links that were in here i'm not sure where they went they might be on one of the other posts but he he uh, went at length um uh, on a ah, what's going on here there we go uh he went into fairly good detail and then i think there's some video links on maybe this post or one of the other ones, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of jump back into this once, uh, once, once this video uploads, I know I'm going to get a bunch of, uh, questions and concerns and comments and complaints. Now people would ask me like, do I, sp you know, is there a specific type of filtration that I really think everybody should have? I think it's just a filter, you know, um, you know, some people prefer sponge filters cause that works really well for them. Uh, I ran hang on back filters for a long, long time. Uh, I ran a lot of old Rena canister filters for a long time. Uh, Fluval filters, 
canister filters, hang on back filters. Um, and then I eventually ended up switching over to sumps just because it really works well for me to run a sump. Does that mean it's the only way to do it? Oh, hell no. Uh, there's a whole variety of ways to do it. Just make sure you have some kind of filtration going on. And, you know, t what's even more important than actually having filtration is that you are monitoring your water quality and uh, making sure what's going on. Because, um, you know, a lot of the big discus farms out there, a lot, the discus farms just do 100% water change like twice a day. <laughs> They'll do that like twice a day. And um, there really are... Uh, a lot of different filtration systems out there, different ways of doing things. Uh, I feel like most people in the U.S. or you know other countries that are doing pretty well, and maybe you you leave ten to twelve hours a day, and you're at work, and you have to do all that kind of stuff. It's really important to not count on yourself to be doing water changes and stuff. Uh, my favorite hang on back filter has always been the Aqua Clear series, whether it's the twenty, the thirty, the fifty, the seventy, the one ten, whatever. I don't even know how many sizes they have now. Um, the Aqua Clear hang on back filter has always been my favorite. Uh, I really like the old Rena. Uh, canister filters mainly because the pump is on the back end so like if something gets sucked in it'll just end up down in the pad area versus going the other direction and ending up dead going through uh going through the other direction so uh ooh, doo, 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 doo. mark vickery says well i'm pretty sure that glass tanks are designed to be supported on their four corners um yeah i think they are uh, and that's how I've always done it. But if you could think of it this way, if you have a rectangle, right? Like let's say you have a rectangle like this and you support this side, this side, and this side, you'd be supporting all four corners, right? Um, you just wouldn't be covering that one stretch across the front, which might be in the way of some stuff, but you can't do that with, uh, you can only do that with a glass tank. Do, 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 do. Okay, guys. Uh, honestly, I kind of feel like I'm about to fall asleep. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, and I just heard Vicky came home. So uh, I'm going to go try to spend a little QT with the old baby and Vicky Toria. And I hope you guys all have a fantastic day out there. Oh, man, we just got a uh, affiliate order came in. I will remind people that uh, the Aquarium Co-op is... Um, is our affiliate sponsor so if you want to go buy something something like that click on the uh, aquarium co-op links it'll take you over there maybe you want to buy some sponge filter maybe you want to do nothing and just go over there and look at the website just be sure to go through our uh, our little portal there it'll take you over to that amazon also um patreon also memberships also man it, there's just a lot of ways to support if you like um getting closer and closer to hopefully solidifying some ideas on this maker space i am uh i'll be back out in the field doing some more jobs trying to make some money anyhow love you guys and i will talk to you all on the old flip side